I only have one question. I want to know what woe means in Hebrew. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There you go. Hey, I feel like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. Right, Froggy? Uh, it really is. We've had a wonderful time in the last several months, my wife and I, and George, Lupe, and Cuba, and then later on with our group from our church that we had the privilege of being in Israel um, the last couple weeks. And um, I feel like I have to kind of reintroduce myself, but, but anyway, it's been, um, it's been an awesome experience, and I'm so grateful um, for all your prayers for holding down the fort as um, I was away from the pulpit for all those weeks and months. And again, just grateful for the leaders and the men and the women in this body that are so, that you're so precious and so incredible to my wife and I. Uh, Larry's with the kids today, so I would bring her up here and I know she feels the same way because we talked several times as we were away from everybody these last few days. Because after the group left a week ago or whenever it was, We've kind of lost track of time. We stuck around <clears throat> for another four or five days for a couple of reasons. Um, I, I don't know. Is Eileen here today? Yeah, there's Eileen. We had a chance to meet up with Arie, and that was very precious. A good friend of Eileen's who lived here, a Jewish man, who please keep him in your prayers. He's got brain cancer, and he's dealing with some stuff, and we were able to go see him in a place called um, um, Bat Yam which is just south of Tel Aviv. And then I was on a mission from God. I had to go find Elijah's cave up in Haifa. And I finally found it after being told it was here and then there and everywhere else. But uh, it was just a really good time, a fun time, because I was able to spend about four or five days with just Larry and I kind of exploring, checking things out. And, um, but gosh, it's good to be home. So with that said, take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 21. We are on the, yes, I promise, folks, on the downside of our study. We've been in this book roughly for about a year and a half now. A very important part of your Bible. The book of Acts is the book that serves as a bridge between the Old and New Testaments. We often don't think about it as such or realize it. But all along, from the beginning of time, from the beginning of, of the creation of Adam and Eve, God had a very unique entity in mind. He had a plan for this bride, for this woman in the Old Testament. We know her as Adam's wife, Eve. And she is nothing more than a picture of this profound spiritual truth where Jesus and God was going to birth this thing, this entity called the church which is we know from the letter to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 5, the church is nothing more than the bride of Jesus Christ. The bride that he died for, that he shed his blood for. So what you find in the book of Acts and why we've subtitled it and given it the theme of a journey of a lifetime is the journey that God has allowed us to see and he has revealed to us in this very fascinating, unique book that we know as the book of Acts, which brings to light this transition where God was using the nation of Israel to bring forth and bring about a kingdom on this planet. When Jesus came the first time, we know him, and the Bible is clear in Matthew chapter 1, that he was to be the savior of the world. But just as profoundly and just as significantly, Jesus came the first time to establish a kingdom on this earth. If you remember from the story of the, the wise men, we're heading now into the Christmas season, and we're all familiar with the wise men, right? Everybody's going to be taking out and unpacking their Christmas stuff, and everybody's going to pull out their manger scene. There's always three guys there, right? That we know as the wise men from the east, the magi, if you will. Anybody know why there's three? The three gifts. The Bible doesn't tell you how many wise men there were. It could have been two. We know that there are more than one because it's plural, right? Give a little vocabulary lesson here or a grammar lesson. But we know that it was plural. But the reason why the assumption is made that there were three is because of the three gifts. Gold, silver, and frankincense. But when those guys show up. In Bethlehem of Judea, 
They asked a very profound question in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. You know what the question was? The only question that they asked as they were looking for Jesus? Where is he that is born King of the Jews? He came to establish a kingdom and a throne on planet Earth. So four chapters later, four chapters later in the, in the gospel of Matthew chapters 5 through 7, you find in the word of God what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. You know what Jesus was doing with the Sermon on the Mount? He was laying out the constitution for the kingdom. Some of us had a, the privilege of standing in the place where, lay, where Jesus laid out the Sermon on the Town. It was known as the, the Church of the Beatitudes, just north of the Sea of Galilee. And it was awesome to be able to see and look over the sea and stand probably where Jesus stood as he laid out that constitution, where he reminded his followers that I'm going to be here and I'm going to establish my kingdom and I will sit on this throne. And as you read the rest of the Gospels, specifically the Gospel of Matthew, that kingdom... And that king was rejected. And that king hung on a cross. And they put a crown of thorns on his head to mock him, to ridicule him. Because all along in that process, in that journey, as we start to delve into the book of Acts, Jesus never lost sight of his purpose and his plan for his bride. For this thing called the church. There was no such thing as the church in the Gospels. The church is born and the church is birthed in this amazing book that we know as the book of Acts. Where he went and he transitioned and he brought about this thing where he had you and he had me in mind way out here in what we know today as Santa Fe, New Mexico. The church. Ascent. Bible Church. You know what the word church means? A gathering of people, an assembly. And we gather here today for one reason and one reason only, for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to glorify Him. He left you on this planet after He saved you because He's got a plan, He's got a purpose for you, and that's part of the journey is realizing who we are in Christ. And knowing and realizing that there's a plan, there's a purpose in him realizing and doing what he did. So when he creates this thing called the church and he had you and he had me in mind, he places us in this thing for a purpose. To see his mission come through. To see his mission realized. Most of you, as you leave this building each and every Sunday, we have a sign right over the doors as you exit out. You know what it says? You are now entering into the mission field. Your mission field is outside those doors. And this is what the book of Acts is about. This is what God has revealed to us in this transition. Take your Bibles real quick with me as I do a quick, real quick overview. Because I haven't been behind this pulpit. I was looking at my notes earlier in the week. I think it was October 14th, the last time we were together in the book of Acts. So just a quick refresher. Look with me in Acts chapter 1 to kind of give you some perspective and some grasp of the whole notion or idea of this kingdom thing. After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, after the Passion Week as we have come to know it, which plays out in the spring during Passover, a lot of folks don't realize this, but he stuck around another 40 days. Another 40 days, Jesus stood behind in Jerusalem, laying out some fascinating things to his followers, to the apostles. And he, and, and, and he does this in chapter number one. Look with me real quick in Acts chapter one. This is how the, the passage begins. It says in verse three, to whom also... Speaking of the apostles, he showed himself alive after his passion. The passion being that week where Jesus was going to the cross. After his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining, listen to this, to the kingdom of God. These kingdom of God things, Jesus was beginning to reveal to them some spiritual things. Some spiritual truths about this thing that was going to show up at the end of the book of Acts. Some 40 years later, known as the church. 
And as you get into the, 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 the context of what's playing out, it says this in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, the them or the 11 disciples, obviously Judas had already committed suicide at this point. It says this, he commanded them that they should not depart from where? From Jerusalem. Wasn't it awesome? Wasn't it awesome being in Jerusalem? Very special, unique place in God's plan. It is the apple of God's eye, it says in Psalms. And to be able to walk where Jesus walked and be able to stand where Peter stood in Acts chapter 2 as he proclaimed at Pentecost the coming of the Holy Spirit and all those things that we read about in Acts, we had the privilege to be there and to witness and to see some of these incredible places in the Bible. It says this next here in verse Number four, and he commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. And that promise was to be, listen to me, folks, John chapter 14, his Holy Spirit. That part of God that was to indwell the believer. You know what makes the church so unique and so special? As you study the Bible from Adam and Eve to the end of time, all these people groups that have lived Throughout history, the only people group, the only group of people that have had the privilege of having God indwell them has been those living in the church age. You have in you, living in you, the creator of the universe. You have living in you, the God that created all that we see, the God that sits on the throne, sovereign, providential in his plan and his purpose for our lives that is the power that you hold in you the issue and it begs the question are we letting him live through us or are we living it out it says this in verse number five for john truly baptized with water speaking of that jewish baptism back in matthew three but ye shall be baptized with the holy ghost not many days hence in other words he's coming Acts chapter 2, and then listen to this question that is asked here in verse 6. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again what? The kingdom to Israel. See what the issue was? All right, cool stuff, Lord. Thank you for revealing to us all these spiritual things. But when are you setting up your throne in Jerusalem? When are you establishing your kingdom? And listen to his reply. In verse number seven, he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the father hath put in his own power. Listen to verse eight, which leads us to this next slide. He says this, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come unto you, upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. In that one verse, Jesus laid out his plan for you and for me. He says, I want you to be witnesses for me. Now the challenge and the issue for us is now we become a part of this thing, this entity called the church, that you see him creating in the book of Acts. Will you embrace and consider the mission that he's given you. He didn't save you to leave you here on this planet just sucking his air and taking another seat in church. He saved you and he saved me because he's got a plan and he's got a purpose for your life. And this thing called the church, this thing called the bride of Christ, the ecclesia, the assembling together, as we gather together, as we train, as we develop, as we grow, and God begins to reveal his plan and his purpose for our lives, he prepares us and he equips us to go out those doors to be those witnesses, to be that light, to be that testimony that a lost and dying world needs, to be the only hope that a hopeless world doesn't have. This is what the book of Acts is all about. So when we get to chapter 21, which is where we're at now, we find ourselves 
at an interesting place in this journey. Because those of you that have been with us in this series for the last year and whatever months it's been, as we've looked at this incredible book known as the book of Acts, the birth of the church, the transition from a Jewish kingdom structure to a spiritual church, having you and, a, and, and a, the body of Christ in mind, you see this thing playing out and God beginning to do some amazing things. And just like that kingdom was postponed in the New Testament, during the book of Acts, God made a promise to those Jews way back in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15 that someday he would restore that kingdom to Israel. And you know what we witnessed? Those of us that were in Israel just a couple weeks ago, a return to the land like never before. After we dropped you guys off at the airport, we drove around Tel Aviv and later to Haifa and to Akka and some of these places up north. And there's so much building and so much construction going on as God's people continue and begin to return to the land like never before. The issue, and it begs the question, where do we sit where do you and I reside in that plan that God has established in his word? It's time for us to wake up and realize that he's moving. And he wants and he desires to use you and me in this journey and in this plan. And God forbid that we waste and we squander our lives for the nonsense and the, and the, 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 the things that don't matter in this life. Because to God... The most precious thing are the souls of men and women. The hope that only he can bring. And as we get to Acts chapter 21 and we're finally going to get there. I shared with you a few weeks ago. Back in October. How this guy, the Apostle Paul, who was not the main guy in the early part of the book, if you remember. Who can remind me about who the main character was in the early part of the book of Acts? It was Peter. Peter. And God used Peter in an amazing way, but later on, after chapter 9, 10, and 11, Paul becomes the man. This is why 80% of your New Testament, 80% of your New Testament Bible consists of letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. Letters to churches, like the church in Rome, in Corinth, in Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, and Thessalonica. And he wrote letters to individuals like Timothy and Titus and Philemon. You know who these guys were? They were followers of Jesus Christ. Men and women who embraced the mission, the purpose that God had for them in their lives. And that's what you find in the book of Acts. You find the backstory of all those letters that we read in the New Testament when we're reading Corinthians or Ephesians or Philippians. All these places on a map that were so key and so critical in God moving as he had Santa Fe, New Mexico in his heart. The uttermost. When we talk about the uttermost, we are, as it relates to the book of Acts, the uttermost. And here we are, 2,000 years later. God still working. God still moving. God still orchestrating people, places, and events to bring a spiritual and physical and literal kingdom back to this planet like he intended at the very beginning of time. So for us, what is our Jerusalem? Jack, big favor. Can you stand up, Jack, real quick? See, I want everybody to read this t-shirt. The front, Jack. Do a little, do a little, um, what do they call those? Those, pirouette. a pirouette. Can we pray with you? Those shirts, we're going to ask that you wear when we gather together, or even individuals, so that that shirt could ask the question, do you need prayer? Absolutely. 
Because in our community, in our Jerusalem, we have people that are in desperate need of prayer. And you and I are the only light and the only hope that they may ever have in our own little Jerusalem here. You know what our Samaria is? Which is so cool. Nambe Pueblo. This Thursday, we're getting together. Where's Arlene and where's Roberta? This Thursday, we're on. This Thursday, God has blessed us with our Samaria. The Samaritans were a unique group of people. If you remember, we talked about their history. These are a, a remnant or a people group that were made up of, of Assyrians who conquered the 10 northern tribes of Israel and took the men captive, took them back to Nineveh, to northern Iraq, to where Mosul is today. And then they began to breed with their women. And all of a sudden you have these half-breed groups of people or a group of people known as the Samaritans. We stood on Mount Gerizim, which is the holy mountain of the Samaritan people. And I learned an interesting fact is we were sitting in the bus while people, some people went to go get water. Larry, my wife, was taking pictures of this guy writing on a wall, painting some script on a wall. As we were sitting in this little town just near the Mount, Mount Gerizim. And I asked Jim Merton, what is that script? Because it wasn't Hebrew and it wasn't Arabic. I said, what is that script? And he said, it's Samaritan. They're still there. You know, I learned an interesting fact. There's only 750 of them left on the planet. A group right there in that little village that we were in, in Gerizim, and another group near Tel Aviv. 750, they're still there. You know what? We have some Samaritans in our midst, some half priests. That's who the Samaritans were, right? They just live north of us. Our Pueblo peoples. And then we have the uttermost. You know what the uttermost became for us this past year, these last couple of years? Cuba and even Israel. Israel. We support and we help fund the ministry of two Jewish guys in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is our uttermost. Isn't God cool? See how he works? See how he goes full circle? I know now why every time I run into, I run into Jonathan and to Moshe, those two guys in Jerusalem, thanks to Larry Social, man, we've developed a passion and a love for these guys. I know now that every time I run into them, they say, hallelujah. I always thought, it's time to sing a song. No, you know what they're doing? They're praising God. Baruch Hashem. Right, Larry? First words out of their mouth. Glory to God. First, you can't wait for you guys to see them and meet them again. They'll be back soon. And I'm going to tell you, man, and Larry Social will give you a report here in a couple weeks. God's doing some amazing things with their ministry in Jerusalem and in Arad near Beersheba. Because of your prayers and your love for what God is doing in our outermost which is Jerusalem. Man, God is so good. This has been our journey. Now, speaking of journeys, let me just bring you up to speed on Paul's journey. As, we, as we've looked the last several weeks and months, we're in the third and final journey of Paul's missionary journeys. And as we saw last time we were together in the book of Acts chapter 21, Paul and God's plan for him all along was to get to Rome was to have an impact in Rome. But the Apostle Paul, as we saw in the first 16 verses of chapter 21, could not get Jerusalem off of his heart. His love and his passion for his people. He said to them, I've got to get there. I've got to go. I need to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost, you know why? Because Jews from all over the world that had been dispersed after the Babylonian and Assyrian conquest had been spread, the diaspora, the diaspora, and they had been spread out through Asia Minor and Egypt and all these other places. And now they're coming to gather in Jerusalem. And he says, I need to get home. I need to get back to Jerusalem so I could proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ one last time for the people that I love. 
In, the, in Romans chapter 9, you find his love. You see him writing in that letter his love for his people. He says in that letter, I wish I could be accursed for my people. I would die for my people if they would only come to the knowledge, the saving knowledge of my Savior, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want them to be saved like I was saved, Paul says in Romans 9. So what you find in this journey, in the last leg of his journey, Paul desiring nothing more in his life but to get back to this city of peace. The city of peace Right, Bob Lee and Tish? How much peace did we see in that city in the last couple of weeks? Not a whole lot. You go into the walls, of, inside the walls of the old, what is known as the old city. It's divided into four quarters. There's the Armenian quarter, which is the group associated with the Eastern Orthodox Church. There's the Christian quarter, which is the people that are associated with the Roman Catholic Church. There's the Jewish quarter. This is the part of Israel or the part of Jerusalem in the old city where you see the Jews praying at the western wall because that's the only access they have to the Temple Mount because you know who has control of the Temple Mount today? The Muslims, Islam, the owners of the fourth quarter of that city. And you know what you see? The one consistent thing that you see in all four quarters regardless of where you are? Israeli military keeping the peace because of how much religions and religious people despise and hate each other. And we serve a God and a Christ who died for each and every human being on this planet to bring redemption and perspective and light regardless of religion. You know what it's called? The church. The body of Christ. It has nothing and never has been anything to do with religion with Christ. With God. It's always been about this body. This relationship. That Jesus desired to have with his followers. And Paul learned that. And he embraced that. And he did, wanted nothing more in his life. Than to communicate that. So you see in his journeys. Through all of Asia Minor. Which is modern day Turkey. And into, into Macedonia. Which is northern Greece. And southern Greece. And ultimately into Rome. He desired nothing more. Than to reveal the grace of Jesus Christ. To the lost souls of men and women. Throughout the then known world. And in those journeys. God kept pricking at his heart. Paul had a desire to get back to the heart of the Jewish religion. And it was Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, look with me in chapter number 20. If you remember this, he was making his way back from Greece. Made his way back into, if you follow along with me real quick up here on the screen. As you consider what Paul was doing, he made his way from from. Um, from Philippi back to Ephesus and ultimately to this town called Miletus. And it says here in chapter number 20, look with me in verse number 615. And when he had sailed thence and he came the next day against Chilios. And the next day he arrived at Samos and tarried at Trochviglium. And on the next day he came to Miletus, which is right here. This little green dot is Miletus. Why did he bypass Ephesus? Because Ephesus was a strategic important and, and a critical place in Paul's ministry. That's where you find the letter to the Ephesians. And there he had befriended and he had invested so much in the believers there that he knew that if he showed up, it would have an impact on him getting to Jerusalem. How do you know that? Look at verse number 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus. In other words, I'm going to bypass it. Because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem, the day of Pentecost. He knew that these Jews from all over the planet would be assembled in Jerusalem at Pentecost. He says, I need to get there. And I'm going to do whatever I need to do to have the greatest impact on the believer's 
and the believers and the non-believers in Jerusalem his love for the Jewish people. And as you look back and read the first 16 verses that we looked at a couple weeks ago, if you remember this, as Paul was making his way down from, from Miletus all the way down into Sidon, to Sidon, to Tyre, Potomus, that is Acha. Larry and I had dinner there the other night. It was a really beautiful and key place, huge crusader walls. As he was making his way down, everybody and their mother were saying, don't go there, Paul. Don't go. They're going to kill you. They'll arrest you. I love Paul. Talk about a guy who got it. He said, I don't care what they do to me. I'm prepared to die for God's glory. And ultimately, he makes it there. And this is where the story picks up. And what we're going to look at this morning are some principles related to this, this theme. What happens when misunderstanding takes control? When we lose sight of who God is and God's plan and his purpose in our lives. Because everybody in this room is susceptible to losing purpose and perspective in life. If we don't understand and if we don't embrace who and why it is that God created you. And as Paul makes his way after being discouraged by all these guys as he's making his way down the west coast and one of the key and one of those strategic places was Caesarea. Remember he met with Philip there? Wasn't Caesarea cool? Those Roman ruins. The aqueducts. We took a bunch of picker, pictures near that. was all Caesarea. Those were all places that Paul was making his way through. Isn't that cool? That God led you to these places. You were looking, some of you, at the same aqueducts that the Apostle Paul was looking at. And it says this in verse number 17. And this is where the story picks up. And when we are come to Jerusalem, he's there. Here's the map. He's there. Acts 21, 17 through 40. This is where we're camping out today. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. The brethren are those believers. And one of them was an apostle, the half-brother of Jesus, James, who became the leader of the believers in Jerusalem. And they received him, the Bible says, gladly. But if you know anything about Paul and his life, no matter where he went, man, he always caused a stir, didn't he? I love the Apostle Paul. You know why? Because he always stayed true to God's word. He always stayed true to who Jesus Christ was and what he had planned for his life. He could have cared less what everybody else thought or thinks. Man, what a way to live. The most liberating way that you could ever live in this life is knowing and realizing that God has put in this book exactly what he needs you and I to have in this age in terms of who he is and what his plan is for your life. And it says this in this passage in verse number, eight, number 18, and the day following Paul, he went in with us unto James. And all the elders were present and when he had saluted them, he declared particularly that what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. We've been talking about who the Jewish people are. We talk about this in Bible study all the time. The Bible's written to three groups of people, three and only three the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. I think we know from history who the Jewish people are, right? We know who they are. What's fascinating to me is they're heading back to the land like never before. God's working. God's plan is in play as we speak. Now it begs the question, who are the Gentiles? Or what is a Gentile? Anybody have any idea? Anybody who's not Jewish? And God, cool. He had us simple minds in mind when he wrote his word. So he's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And he's got some things that he writes in his words, specifically to the Jewish people, the old, entire Old Testament is directly written to them. We know it as the law of Moses. 
And then there's some things written to us, the church, which is all those letters that you find in the New Testament. And what is so cool about God, when he creates this thing called the church, you know what he says? I could give a flip if you're Jewish or a Gentile. Just accept the grace, the gift of grace that Jesus Christ offers on the cross. And now you're a part of his church. Three times in Romans and Colossians and Galatians, Paul writes, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Because in Christ, we're all one. That is the beauty of the church. That it's, that's its uniqueness. So when Christ births this thing called the church, and now he's going back and he's, he's sharing with these Jewish believers that chose to stay in Jerusalem what God was doing in all of Turkey and all of Greece and ultimately into Europe and get this, even Spain. You see Spain mentioned in the book of Romans. Tell me, you Hispanos, that God didn't have you in mind. And you see this whole storyline play out and look at the response here. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews that are, that are which believe and they are all zealous of the law. So Paul says to these guys, he said, what? God's doing some incredible things in all of Asia and all of Europe as he's bringing Gentiles in this thing called the church. And you know what these guys say? But there's also Jews in this journey that you've been able to witness. But Paul, please don't lose sight of the fact that these Jews are still adherent to the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, look at the next verse. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses saying that they ought not to circumcise their children neither to walk after their customs isn't that interesting that men always have a tendency to bring the issue back to what to religion to tradition to customs See, the most liberating experience you will ever have is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This is why Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. In other words, it separates you from who God is and what he's trying to reveal to you. But to be spiritually minded is this, watch, life and peace. Who in this room wants and desires life and peace in their life? It's promised to you in his word. And you know what the key is? Knowing and realizing what Jesus Christ did for you on that cross. And as you receive him, as you accept him as your savior, the Holy Spirit now indwells you. And now you have the power, spiritually speaking. Not your own power, his power to live a life of, a life, of life and peace. This is the God that we serve. This is the God of the New Testament. This is the God of the entire Bible. And he's had every man, woman, and child in mind. And what does man do? What does he have a tendency of doing? Introducing the law. Introducing bondage and rules and regulations that you got to look a certain way, dress a certain way. You got to have your shirt tucked. I would never make it into heaven. <laughs> Ever. I was reading a magazine on the plane over there. There's, I saw a flyer. Did you guys know that there's a shirt brand out there called Untuck It? That is so cool. I said, why didn't I think of that? This guy's making millions over having untucked shirts. I say that because... Somebody told me the other day that I should tuck my shirt so I won't look like a slob. But you know what I love? Jesus still loves me in spite of me. I would never talk about your ugly Eagles jersey, would I? <laughs> would I? Are you Raider fans that just don't seem to get it? I would never diss on you. Ever. But you know what you see in this, in this story? 
a misunderstanding of God's mission. Religion, always desiring to impose rules and regulations on the people. That you got to do this or you got to do that. Did we not see it firsthand in that beautiful, peaceful city known as Jerusalem? How IDF forces had to walk around to keep the peace because of the hatred of the different customs and traditions that all these four religions maintain even to this day. And Jesus says, man, I want to liberate you. Where the Spirit of God, there is what? Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. How powerful is that? What an incredible promise that is. And what you find in this story, in this notion or this concept of a stagnant church is a church that is fearful of change. We can never be fearful in this church of God changing things up transitioning us the whole book of acts the entire bible and there's seven major changes in the bible we know them as what you bible wednesday night bible people well, there are what seven dispensations where god changed things up seven different times to bring forth his plan and his purpose to mankind change is a good thing i used to work for the corps of engineers and I had this colonel colonel atkinson full bird that i respected so dearly and he always used to write at the end of his emails, this quote, if you do what you've always done, you'll only get what you've always had. Isn't that cool? Isn't that true? Aren't you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Do something. Let God be God in your life. There are resources. We are a resource to you in helping you overcome whatever it is that you may be dealing with. But if you think for a second that you're going to be able to do this on your own and in your flesh, you're sadly mistaken. This is why Jesus, when he ascended in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, replaced himself with three things. The word of God, the spirit of God, and the people of God. He's given us everything that we need. You know what he gave you for your physical body? The people of God. You know what he gave you for your soul? The word of God. And you know what he gave you for your spirit? Who you are as a soul? The Spirit of God. Tell me he doesn't fulfill any and every need that you and I have. Spiritually, emotionally, and even physically. And these guys chose not to change. Because of the law. Another thing that you find here in verses 20 and 21. You find a stagnant church that will only focus inwardly. All they could concern themselves with, if you look at the text, was the customs and traditions of the day. Why, Paul? Why, Paul, are you not requiring the, the Gentiles to be circumcised like the Jews if they're truly Gentiles? Do you guys remember from Acts chapter 15, there was an entire, entire council in Jerusalem on this very issue. Why are you guys not circumcising the Gentiles? Because you know what? He wasn't dealing with the physical issue anymore. And now spiritual in Colossians chapter 2, he referred to the circumcision of the what? Of the heart. Pulling back that veil so God could see what's really in our hearts. And you find in this text, listen to what Paul says as it relates to this issue. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 through 20, Paul writes these words to the Corinthians. He says, but as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. Tell me that's not liberty. In other words, if you want to wear a, a, a yarmulke, if you want to wear a, a uh, what do they call Larry, the little ones? A kipo? Whatever it's called, the little things that they wear when we had to go to the Western Wall. He says, go for it, man. Free. Keep reading. Watch this. This is so cool. So let everyone walk. And so ordain I all in all the churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. For circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But the keeping of the commandments of God. You know what, he, you know what he's saying in that verse? You just want to force your rules on people. And God wants you to live free. 
And he says in verse 20, so let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Our Jewish brothers, our Jewish believers who love Jesus more than you will ever know, they always refer to him as Yeshua. Yeah, Larry went over there and Maggie and they celebrated Shabbat dinner with them. Praise God. You are free. Back in the day, our church in Kansas City used to send us off to the, some of us that were getting training on how to preach to these little tiny Baptist churches in southern Missouri. As legalistic as you'll find anywhere. You know what a legalistic church is? People that put rules. In other words, Larry, you're going to have to wear a skirt below your knees. Your toes can't show. And you know what we said? So what? We're free. Who cares? Don't be a stumbling block. Don't be a knucklehead all your life. There's half our church for next week. <laughs> know that you are free because of who he is and what he did in your life. In verses 22 and 23, a stagnant church will only be concerned with the opinion of the masses. Look at the next couple verses. So what is it therefore in the multitude must needs come together for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee for we have four men which have a vow on them. In other words, these guys in Jerusalem began to test the apostle Paul. You know, because the guys in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, they were more concerned about what the people thought. You know what, folks? I don't want to offend any of you, but I could really give a flip what you think about my untucked shirt. I really do. The only thing that matters to me is what he thinks and what he says. I love the middle verse of all the Bible, the 118 Psalm, verse 18. It's it. The psalmist wrote these words. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Men will always have an opinion about something. They'll always want to hold you hostage over something and put a rule over you and expect this or expect that before you become more and more spiritual. And Paul was no different. You know what he said? We got these four dudes that have taken a Nazarite vow. If you don't know what that is, go back to the book of Numbers and you'll see what was expected of these Nazarites. In other words, they were to not, not to allow any strong drink to touch their lips they were not to touch anything dead in their lives and they were to shave their heads. Paul said, what do you mean, man? I just got a haircut yesterday and now you want me to shave my head? And look at what Paul does. Look at this in verse number 24. He says, them take and purify thyself with them and be at charge with them that they may shave their heads and that they may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the what? The law. Hang, stick to the rules, Paul. And as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from the things offered to idols and from the blood and from the, strain, and the, from the strangled and from the fornication. And again, what, it, what these guys are trying to say is there's two sets of rules for the Jews and for the Gentiles. No, man. The same God that died for the Jews also died for the Gentiles. And because of what he did... You're not free and liberated to sin. He freed you so that you can glorify him. So that you can serve him with this one life that he's blessed you with. Now look at the next verse. Then Paul, he took the men and the next day purifying himself with them. He entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for any, every one of them. You know, Paul said, bring it on. I'll wear a skirt. I'll wear shoes. I don't mean Paul was wearing a skirt. You know, was, I'll do whatever it takes to see my Jew, Jewish brothers and sisters come to Christ. 
Listen closely to these words in 1 Corinthians 9. Turn with me. I want you to read these with me. This is the gospel. This is, this is the New Testament. It relates to how God perceives how we are to respond. It says this in verse number 16 of chapter 9. For though I preach the gospel, Paul says, I have nothing to glorify of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For I do this willingly. I have a reward. But it against but put it against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. In other words, Paul says, God has a message for me to communicate. You know what that message is? It's pretty simple. The death, burial, and resurrection. This is what people need. This is the only thing they need. And from that point on, the issue becomes growth and spiritual maturity. Look at verse 18. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. That I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men. Right? Yet have I made myself servant unto all men. That I might gain the more. You want me to dunk myself with these four ball headed dudes? Let's do it. Look at the next verse. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, and that I might gain the Jews. And to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law. Gentiles, in other words, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. So to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I by all means, what? Save some. What a motive. What an incredible, powerful perspective. How liberating is that? And in the next series of verses, you see exactly how they felt about the Apostle Paul and his message. In verse number 27, you find the rest of the story where Paul actually gets Arrested, And when seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, mark that phrase, these were Jews that had made their way from what is modern day Turkey. Jews that had heard the gospel that rejected it. I'm not talking believers now, Jewish believers. These were Jews that pushed back to the Apostle Paul that happened to be there to celebrate Pentecost. When they saw him in the temple, they stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. Crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law. And this place and hither brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. Man, the place was already polluted. Go back and study the, the vanguard of the Pharisees and the, and the scribes and the Sadducees and what they had done with the temple. Remember when Jesus had to go in and turn the tables over and call them out because of what he witnessed and these guys these religious guys god bless them all they could concern themselves is that fact polluted them by bringing gentiles in which he never really did there was an entire court dedicated to the gentiles where they could arise but paul never brought any of these gentiles in you know what you find in these religious folks the accuser the accuser of the brethren. Don't you find it interesting that the term or the word devil. Why did I point at David when I said that? I'm not sure. Because we're talking terminology here. That's why. Did you know that the word devil is only a New Testament term or title given to the adversary? Only shows up in the New Testament. First time is in the gospel of Matthew chapter 4. The temptation of Christ. You know what the word devil means? Accuser. He's all about accusing. That's how you know the source of any accusations that you see playing out in Revelation chapter 12. He's referred to and he's called the accuser of the brethren. He stands before the throne to this day accusing you before God. Saying to God things like, Paul Smith, you knucklehead. He's not worthy of 
you being his God? That's called guilt. He will do anything and everything to hinder and affect your relationship with God. These guys are full of false accusations. Did you know, folks, that God is a hater? That there are things that God hates desperately with all his heart? Yeah, God's a hater. Listen to Proverbs chapter 6. Verses 16 through 19, these six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. This world will give an account to what it does to babies. This country will. This government will. God hates that. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Listen to verse 19. Three times he speaks of accusatory people and liars. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. You better watch out. And you better embrace the things that God hates. Because the more Christ-like you become in this journey... You too will hate these things. And these guys would do anything and everything to manipulate the situation. And you find that in the text. And you see in verse 28 this mob mentality crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people. Look at verse 29. For they had seen before with him in the city, Trophimus and an Ephesian, whom they supposed, supposition, right? That Paul had brought them into the temple. Are you a presumptuous person? There's a thing in the Psalms called presumptuous sin. And all the city was moved. And the people ran together and they took Paul and they drew him out of the temple. And forthwith, the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band. This was a Roman captain centurion who ultimately steps in on Paul's behalf, arrests him, but he saves him from the mob mentality. Don't be part of the mob. It's so easy in this country to get caught up, right? You know what, you know what our mob mentality tool is today? It's called social media. It's an easy way to get caught up in the nonsense of this world I've seen brothers and sisters in Christ. Their relationships break over stinking politics. Really. Here's what I do know about politics. With all that happened this past week, the God of the Bible still sits on the throne. Still sovereign. Still in control. Because at the end of the day, Republicans, Democrats, they're all out of the same old man. It's called politics for a reason. Poly in Greek means many. A tick is a blood-sucking parasite. <laughs> Isn't the Bible cool? And this is what they were doing. Don't allow yourself to get caught up in this mob mentality and be manipulated. Understand the issues. We just had this election. Don't allow the mob to influence what the Bible says. Let this book be your filter and your perspective and your light in a crazy and nutty and bizarre world. And if you want the proof text for that, it's found in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 6 through 16. Walk in the light as he is in the light. Let him be the revelator. Walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, Paul says, for the days are what? Evil. You don't think there's evil out there? You need to get your head out of the sand. It's a real world. And he says, walk circumspectly. And from verses 18 all the way down to 21, he gives you the principles on how you can live that out. You know what one of them is? Praise and prayer. 
Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the King of glory will come in. You know what we don't do? We don't lift up our heads and know and realize that God is working. Change your perspective. And that only happens as you embrace who he is and what he desires to do in your life. And the last principle that we find in our text is not just a mistreatment of the messengers he's arrested, but he's misidentified in the story. And thank God for this Roman soldier. If you really stop and consider, hey, this is a man of character because he didn't let the mob take him. He protected them. He guarded him. Yeah, he shackled him up. But then he takes Paul and he begins to do a fact check and really began to delve into who he was and what he was about. And this is what you find in our last principle here in verses 21, chapter 21, verses 33 through 40. Then the chief captain came near and he took him and he commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing, some another among the multitude. They don't, they're not even on the same page, this, this mob. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after crying, away with him. Away with him. Does that ring a bell? Where else did we hear these types of words spoken exactly? The mob. Your 5,000 friends out there on Facebook. The mob mentality. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee? I love Paul's attitude and his respect for this guy's position and authority. And who said, canst thou speak Greek? And you know what the guy said back to him? It's Greek to me. <laughs> it's a joke. You guys are like way too serious. <laughs> Verse 29. Listen to what this guy thinks of Paul. Are not thou that Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness? 4,000 men that were murderers? Larry, we know who these guys are, huh? The Sicarii. These were assassins, zealots. See, there's hope for you right-wingers still. There was a guy in the Bible by the name of Simon the Zealot who was one of the 12, who was one of these Sicarii that was out there. And you know what these guys would do? They would carry a little Sicarii sword, a little knife about this long, and they would hide it in their robe, and they would go into a mob, and if they would see a Roman soldier or a Roman leader or some even Jewish leader, they would go in and they would stab him and then they would leave. And this guy's asking Paul, are you one of these dudes? Why is it that they want to kill you? But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and he beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, you're just going to have to come back next week <laughs> to find out what he said. But it's so profound and it's so incredible and it's so cool. Because you know what Paul does and you're going to see it next week. He points that mob to Jesus. To Jesus Christ. You know why? Because he knew who he was. He understood his identity. Listen church. If you are a believer. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Right now today. You sit in a heavenly place. You have already been blessed. Past tense. Paul writes about in Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3. Positionally, you are here. The issue and the challenge for us is not our position. 
not your identity, but your condition. This is why God has left the church. This is why he's left us his word. This is why he's left us his spirit to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. That's how he's glorified. And when that begins to happen in this journey, as we begin to embrace who we are in Christ and his plan and his purpose for our lives, you know what you'll do? Your life will bring honor and glory to his name. And you know what the benefit of that whole thing is? When you guys went to college or to school or to trade school or whatever it was that you decided and you chose to go to, you didn't go to school so you can get health insurance, although that might be a motive today, or any other kind of benefit. Did you? You went there because you wanted to be a part of something. You went there because you wanted to have an impact, because you were passionate about something. But as you get that kind of a position in life, you also get these things called benefits, huh? Health insurance, life insurance. 401k, which in a few weeks may mean nothing. You know what that blessing, you know what that benefit is today? Life and peace. Life and peace. Embrace his mission. Own the journey. And watch him rock your world. Thank you, Lord, for our time together this day. Lord, as we consider, Lord, all that you're doing in the life of this man, the Apostle Paul, I just, Lord, thank you and I praise you for who he is and what he's about. And Lord, as we take to heart these principles and, Lord, the mindset of the depravity of man and the human condition. I pray, Lord Jesus, that through the power of your spirit and the power of who you are, Lord Jesus, in our lives, that we would know and that we would understand this incredible life that you've blessed us, each and every one of us with. That, Lord, that we would own it, that we would be a part of this journey with you as, Lord, you lead us into this promised land, this spiritual place, Lord God, that only you... Um, 